you guys help me welcome everyone that is joining us online this morning? Come on, let me, you're glad they're with us today. Yeah, as you can tell, the building is full here where we are this Thanksgiving weekend by the sound of all those happy people clapping their hands together. Uh, we're so grateful during this holiday season that uh, wherever you might be, that we can still connect like this. So we're glad that you're with us today. And uh, it's never lost on us again, the opportunity that we get to be able to, to meet with you like this. So wherever you are in life, you might be just in a great place. You may be going through a difficult season, whatever it is. I hope, and it's been my prayer this week, that today's message will challenge you because I want you to be challenged in your faith. I want you, the, the Holy Spirit to be able to speak to you, all of us, online and here in the building, in such a way that you're not stagnant. I don't know about you, but stagnant things eventually start to smell. And uh, we don't want to smell. I mean, unless you're sweating or you're dirty, but we can do some other stuff for that. But we ought not be stinky Christians. I was looking for a little bit more on this weekend. Y'all got to help me out. It's Thanksgiving weekend. I might be just a little close to the line of irreverent, but that's all right. How many of you hate stinky Christians? Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Bill. I can always count on Bill for a good time. But uh, this morning, I want you to be challenged because here's what I believe God wants for us as we complete this year. I believe he wants us to finish it well. We always start the year well, and we spend so much time at the beginning of the year talking about the things that we want to see happen in our lives, what we want to accomplish. I've always not been a great big goal person, and, and I felt guilty about that for years. Now, there's certain marks that you need to press toward. I get that. Because here's why I'm not a great big goal person. Because every day, I get up expecting to accomplish more that day than the day before. I'm thinking every day ought to be a goal. To get everything in it that you can. To get everything out of it that you can. If you just live that way, even if you've got big goals or small goals or no goals at all, you'll accomplish much if you just refuse to be still and stagnant. Amen? How many of you heard about a, a big Powerball drawing that happened a few weeks ago, over $1.5 billion? I'm glad to tell you all today, I won that. <laughs> Kidding, I did not win that. I would still be here, by the way, if we did. We just may have bought half of St. John's County if we had done that. But, but recently, there was a $1.5 billion Powerball. And because of the election that was going on, uh, did any of you hear that it was some... Someone in Southern California won it. I'm still trying to find them online and send them a request. But there was a lot of discussion at that time that I heard people talking about what they would do, how their life would change if they won all that money. Did anybody ever think, you know, if I won a billion dollars, I would. Anybody ever think like that? Y'all cannot be stinky Christians this morning. How many of you thought, have thought like that? Thank you. Even if you spent two bucks or you think it's illegal and of the devil and you didn't, you still think about when you drive by those billboards. Right now, I'm seeing, I've drove this week and I saw it's over $300 million again. The one next to it was like 15 and I'm like, 15 million. And then every once in a while, I catch myself. I'd take the 15 million. But when you see that big number out there, the big number is what it seems to take to cause some of us to dream or to consider where we are, to, to look at things differently or, or to imagine something else. But it's amazing how our perspective changes when you consider a different reality, isn't it? If I won that lottery, where would I live? What kind of person would I be? How generous would I be? I already know right now, on one hand, I can tell you how many friends I know that pastor, that I would call them and say, what is your mortgage? Because I'm paying it off. And don't tell anybody. Now, are you asking, you play the Powerball? I may have bought a ticket or time or two. That offends you? I'm sorry. They may edit this out of the, the thing today. I don't know. But think about that. How much your perspective changes when you consider a different reality? Now, how would you live if you knew your days were numbered? How would that reality change your perspective? I mean, we talked about this years ago, but if you knew you had 30 days left to live, how would your reality and your perspective change if you knew that? If we're honest, I think most people would live with greater purpose and intention if they knew their time was brief. But the reality is that our time is brief. In, in Psalm chapter 39, verse 4, it says, Lord, remind me, the psalmist said, how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered. How fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width 
of your hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Verse 6 goes on to say, we're merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth not knowing who will spend it. And so, Lord, here was his prayer. Where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Now, rather than listening to those verses and thinking, how dreary, how fleeting is my life, only a breath, only a mitts, not much, not much value. I mean, it could sound like that on the surface, right? That your life isn't very significant. Not true. Just the opposite is true. Because it is brief in comparison to eternity, how much more important it is that you live it well, that you be intentional, that your reality be changed by the fact that it is brief and that it is valuable and what you do does matter. Who you encounter each and every single day, it matters. That's why we're told in Ephesians by Paul, he said in 5.15 Ephesians, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Spurcumspectly there, it literally means to walk cautiously, sensitively, as a person would walk through literally thorny terrain. Anybody ever done that? It's fun to watch my granddaughter. She hates, although she's becoming a little more barefoot lately, but when she was smaller, you could lower her over the grass with bare feet, and she would look like a gymnast with her legs pointing straight up. I mean, you could put her down almost to where her backside was touching. Her legs would go higher to keep her feet from touching the grass. So it was fun to do. How many of you that men know what I'm talking about? You just kind of lower her real quick. Her legs would straight up. We're all like that. If we know something's on the ground that could hurt our feet, you see those people walking around the beach like this, anybody around through the... The shells, I love to watch it. You know, they get, they're just talking all of a sudden and everything changes because something was sharp on the ground. Everything about their perspective and the reality changes when something on the ground can cause you pain. But what you and I are supposed to do is to live with the reality and a perspective about how brief our days and our time is. The idea here is that we walk with intentionality and purpose. Listen to the NIV version. It says, be very careful. How you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Did you know that today is an opportunity? Monday's going to be an opportunity. Tuesday will be an opportunity. Next Friday will be an opportunity. It says in verse 17, Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That's key. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. But listen to this out of the Amplified Version, the same verses, Ephesians 5 to 17. Look carefully then how you walk. Because that's what you're doing in life. You're walking, you're moving. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately. Think about that. Worthily. In other words, realize what God has gifted you with, life. It deserves to be lived with intention and with purpose, not haphazardly. It deserves to be lived accurately, discovering what God wants you to do and doing that well, being very intentional about what you do. Not as the unwise and witless, but as wise sensible, intelligent people. Again, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity. Did you know that when people say wasting time, it comes from a biblical perspective. Wasting time means that you're spending your days in such a way that you're getting nothing in return for them. Their impact is something that has little to no value when it's done with without any wisdom, without any purpose, without any intention. So we want to buy up every opportunity, consume the time in such a way that there's a great return for it. It goes on to say, make the very most of these opportunities because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. Only you can firmly grasp and take hold of what God has called you to do what he's wanting you to do each and every single day. Y'all with me? But here's the deal. Too many of us, too often people live with a sense of procrastination. That I, I, I'll, I'll take care of that later mentality, right? I, I'll never forget my oldest daughter one time. I can't remember exactly how she said it. But something was going on and she said, oh, that's a tomorrow thing. It, and she, it was absolutely, how did she, that's a future me problem. That's what she said. There was some situation, she said, oh, that's a future me problem. 
That's brilliant, kind of. That should be on a t-shirt somewhere. That's a future me problem. Anybody ever live like that? Ah, that's a future me problem. I don't know if you do that with, like, when you buy a home and you've got household issues. If you say those are future me problems, those future me problems, yeah. Yes, they are. That's like when the light comes on in your dash, you're like, ah, that's a future me problem. Until you're sitting on the side of the road calling Uber because your family's not coming. Future me problem. That is how we are not supposed to live. Sometimes we say things like this. One day when things are like this. One day when things are like that. Then I'll take care of that. Then I'll engage. Then I'll get involved. That's when I'll do what I feel like God's put on my heart to do. Some people call it the when-then syndrome. And for a single person, it might be this. Hey, one day when I get married, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be fulfilled. Then I'll care about that. For the dad, it might be the guy who says, you know, one day when things get going better at work, th- then I'll have more time for the family. Hey, one, one, one day when, when, when I get that promotion, that's when I'll take care of those things. For the couple, the married couple, it might be, Hey, one day when the kids are older, then we'll spend some quality time with one another. Then we'll invest in our marriage again. I mean, we did when we're dated. Let's coast on that. So we'll invest later. So when a church has something like a marriage conference or a marriage series, you're like, eh, we we don't really need that. Yes, you do. You all do. I do. The win-then syndrome is not something you want to break your life against. Because the problem is this. The then rarely comes. I don't know what your when then is, but I want to give you three thoughts to consider if you've been doing that in any area of your life. Hey, when this happens or when that happens, then I'll do this. Then I'll engage in this. Number one is this. Turn your when into now. Don't say when this happens. No, just turn when into now. I remember whenever I was getting ready to to go to college and it was here in town and if it hadn't been for music and just the automatic kind of entry that music gave me because they came to our high school and auditioned us for music scholarships and and I was fortunate enough to get them, um, several of them, I didn't have to to do the things that other people kind of did. They kind of did it for me because they wanted to build the music program. So they're like, hey, we'll take care of this, that, and the other. But I can remember the heaviness from my parents. Hey, you've got to get this application in. You've got to get this application. I'm like, yeah, when we get closer to the end of the year. When we get closer. When we get closer. Anybody ever do that? When, it, when we get closer to May, I'll take care of that. The deadline's coming. The deadline's coming. Well, when, when this step, none of, you, none of the rest of you ever did that. Sure. Well, that win eventually came. But here's what you don't need to live with. You don't need to live with the pressure and the anxiety of the wind constantly hanging out there in front of you. Especially if you're married and your wind impacts other people else that are around you. Hey, would you take care of this? Yeah, yeah when I get some time. Whenever this slows down here. When we get through the holidays. How many of you have been saying that about some stuff? If we can just get through the holidays. Can I encourage you this morning to turn your wind into now? Remember again, your life is fleeting. Scripture compares it to a mist. It's brief. And I think the advice that I want to give you, and this is what I believe God is saying to us today, is wherever you are, be all there. Don't wait for when to engage. Don't wait for when to live. Don't wait for when to do what God's put on your heart to do. Don't wait for when to make that phone call. Don't wait for when to step up and rise up and get in your life, get in the game. Are you with me? Maybe some of you were with family over the holidays here and you're like, half these people aren't even here. Uncle so-and-so is just off in la-la land over there or sister so-and-so is over here. Mom and dad just don't seem to be engaged. Anybody have any of those folks around? You're like, where are you? Hello? Wherever you are, God wants you to be all there. And that's the challenge sometimes if you make goals. It's like my phone. On my phone, I've got about 13 constant reminders going. Some of them are my bills. Anybody else like me? And I've got a date on them and a time on them. This Thursday, pay the city card. 
10 a.m. in the morning. Did anybody have any red dots above your reminders on the home screen? Red dot just kind of stays there. You know you have reminders. Some of you may have taken the notification box that goes right there and just said, no, I don't want on-screen notifications. Anybody done that? The red dot on the reminders is enough. I am forever hitting some of those. I got two of them right now this morning. I changed them to this afternoon at 4. Two reminders have today at 4 o'clock on them. Anybody else do like me? You cannot live your life pushing out your win to then. You need to be all in today because you need to see that every season of your life is valuable. Every season is filled with purpose. And you need to see today is an investment in the future. If you're the single person, you need to learn to be content today. I see way too many people who are discontent with where they are, can find no fulfillment where they are, and you're putting this pressure and this weight out there on this person you haven't even met yet who's going to fulfill all your desires and all your expectations and make every day wonderful and every day so enjoyable and over the top and over the moon that married life is going to be just better than anybody's life on social media. How many married people know you can't put that pressure on somebody else? Y'all got quiet on me, married people. You can't put your, the pressure of your happiness and contentment on someone who is incapable of doing that for you. They can influence the environment that you live in. They can have an impact on the outcome of the choices that do influence tomorrow. But inside, Paul said it himself, I have learned to be content with and without. I have learned to be content. Why? Because he knew that nothing and no one was greater than his God to him. So regardless of where he found himself, he was content. Now, I say that as a married guy. I remember being single and thinking, when I didn't have a girlfriend, there's nothing to do. Life's boring. Anybody else remember that? And how many married people are like, oh, what I would give for some peace and quiet. (laughs) Don't say that to your single friends. Hey, listen, let me talk to the married people. You need to be fully engaged today in your marriage. Don't sacrifice your relationship on the altar of things less important. Outside of your relationship with God, your marriage is the next highest priority. Not your phone, not social media, not your career, not your hobbies, and definitely no one else. Turn your win into now. I'm going to re-engage with my spouse today. This morning, I asked my wife, and don't use me as an example, because oftentimes she looks at me and says, I don't feel like we're very connected. So I spin that around on her sometimes. Last night, I saw her get on her phone, and she was watching. I said, babe, I don't feel very, very connected. Truthfully, I was falling asleep on I-10 and just needed to stay up with me. But I did, I said, babe, I'm not feeling very connected. So she went, how many guys find that fun to do? You flip the script on your spouse. Hey, when you get married, it's one of the things you live for. But listen, too many married people are putting some win, some then on their relationship. Hey, when it's not quite as busy in the house, when the kids go to bed, when Saturday comes, and and that when never seems to arrive. I I was talking to somebody recently, and they've got a smaller child, and and I asked them how things were going. You know, it's it's a challenging season. And at first I said to them, well, it'll get better. And then I said, no, I'm so sorry. I am never going to lie to you as a pastor. It doesn't get easier. It just changes. Nobody said having children or a family ever gets easy. The seasons just change. Can we be that honest in church? I mean, they just, they, they grow. Things change. Environments and conditions change. It does not get easier. Marriage doesn't get easier. It just changes. You have to approach it differently. You have to invest differently because scripture says we're to live purposefully, worthily. If God gives you a spouse, you realize that is one of the greatest investments you can make with your life outside of God is in your spouse. 
Because you know why? 20 years from now, you will have written a story together where you will look back at the, the highs and the lows and the difficult times. And like my wife and I say, you know, we could have just called it quits right here. If we had wanted to, we could have said, yeah, this is too, this is too tough. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. But we didn't. We said, no, we're going to knuckle down and bear in right here and we're going to keep going. And in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years from now, that will be the story of our investment. Now, that's not to bring shame or guilt or condemnation to someone who's been through a divorce at all. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, listen, today, today, wherever you are today as a single person or a married person, turn your win into now. You can begin a new story. God's grace and His mercy is new each and every single day. He is looking at you and handing you the same investment opportunity today as you have ever had before. You can spin it all. If you have wasted the last 10 years, guess what you could start doing today? Buying back every opportunity from today, tomorrow, and the next day. God, I'm going to be more intentional about my life and living. Let me say this to any students we might have in the room. You need to give your full attention to what's in front of you now. I don't know if most of the adults are like me in the room, but there were a lot of years in school I was toasting. Anybody else do that besides me? I allowed music and the things that I was doing because they wanted to keep the music program going in the two universities or colleges that I went to here in town. They helped you in a lot of areas make things work right, if I can put it that way. Listen, you need to make the most of every opportunity that is in front of you today. You will set yourself up to succeed if you apply yourself in this season now. I enjoy every part of it, the social the relational, and the academic side of your life. Wherever you are in life, though, don't diminish the season that you're in right now. I can remember leaving college and thinking, man, what I would give to go back to high school if I, could, if I knew what I knew now to go back. <sighs> Redo some of that. But everybody else says, well, you can't go back with who you are today. You got to go back as the same person. Well, it probably wouldn't have changed but be fully invested today because, listen to me, what you do today shows up in your life tomorrow. If you don't believe me, go to any prison and ask everybody that's there if that's true. What you do today will show up in your life tomorrow. That's why when you watch those cop programs and they go, it's the police. Somebody's running out the back door because yesterday showed up today. You with me? Psalm 118 verse 24 says, this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day. Let us rejoice and be glad in this day. Y'all with me? Live fully, be fully connected in this day today. So turn your win into now. Here's the second thought I've got for you. Turn intentions into actions. This is a big one for me. I don't know if y'all are wired at all like me, but if somebody tells me, hey, I'll do this. I fully believe them until they don't. And I'm working on the, if they tell me again, to believe them. Anybody else kind of like me? Hey, I'll do so and so and so and so. My wife can tell you, it 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 is something that I feel inside me when somebody says, I will do something. And I know good and well, the intention is there But the action, it might be limited. Can you imagine your father in heaven? The prayers that God has heard. God, if you will just. Praying for these children. God, if you will just. Then I will. And he sits going, will you now? I am so glad the earth does not revolve around your intention. Because his actions made up for the lack of our intentions, did it not? When the world could not redeem itself, when humanity was so lost that we could not redeem ourselves, that even Jesus walking the earth and talking to the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the learned people of the day, and he was like, oh really? You think you're all that? And you got all those red words there where Jesus talked to to the listeners. He said, hey, if you think that you can rise to perfection... My wife and I discussed this one this week. 
let, let me say, gentlemen, if you've looked on a woman to lust after, you know what? Then you've, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Aren't you grateful he doesn't hold us to that anymore? He was trying to demonstrate to them, listen, your intentions will fall woefully short based on your actions because you can't even control your thoughts. So he says to them, I will take my intentions and show you what God, how much God loves you by giving my life for you so that your lack of follow through doesn't destroy you. But I want to encourage you with this today. Don't be like a lot of people who've got great intentions but those intentions never materialize. There are people, dads, if you're in the building today, who are counting on you. Fathers, if you've given your word, follow through with what you say you will do. Be where you say you will be. Do what you say you will do. Show up when you say you will show up. Even if it means you swear to your own hurt and you don't get to do what you wanted to do or you have to cut something short or you tell someone in a business meeting, I am so sorry, but I got to make this call. I'm so, can we reschedule this? If you gave your word, remember your actions are going to be a reflection of how people perceive as your children or those looking to their heavenly father. As a father, you carry such value and weight in your home. Be men who have action that follow the intention. James 4, 4, verse 17 says, remember, it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Man, what does that mean? That's heavy. It's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Now, I know we don't talk about sin very much, and I don't use that word sin very much, but can I give you the context of what's being described here? In James chapter 4, verse 13, let's look back up and look at this. Here's what the people being described here were thinking, how they were living. They say this, look here. You who say today or tomorrow, we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We'll do business there and we'll make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Again, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and it's gone. What you ought to say, and here's the instruction, is this. If the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or do that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. How many of you know those people? they got more plans than they've got time. They've got more ideas and more vision than they've got follow-through. Love all of that. That's attractive. I'm drawn to people with big vision. I've always been a guy who kind of was in the middle, though, and it's not my strength. I could tell you a bunch of stuff I'd love to see, but I always temper it. I don't know why, it's just the way I'm wired. But I think we all need to meet in the middle here when it concerns intentions. And remember, like verse 17 says, it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Well, what he's basically saying this is it's foolish to see yourself as in complete control of your life. You really truly don't know what may or may not happen tomorrow. I mean, my goodness, the Gators lost this weekend. No one saw that coming. The Lord himself was displeased with that. Being that you don't control everything about tomorrow, you got to be careful that you're so convicted about what will happen tomorrow, and then when it doesn't happen, it diminishes, it dilutes your integrity. The trustworthiness that you're trying to, to garner and to gain with those around you. But even worse is to disregard God and His will and His purpose for your life. I don't want that to be you. The sin then is this, what we're talking about here. It's failing to do what God wants you to do. That's the sin. See, it's a sin to know what God wants you to do and not do that. Whatever God's put in your heart to do, whatever He's, he's led you to do, whatever He's been tugging on your heart to do, whatever He's kind of been impressing you to do, whatever the nudge has been, and you do not do it, that's the sin. Are y'all with me? So I got a few questions for you. What good intentions have you not acted on yet? Has God asked you to talk to somebody and you've not done it? Has He asked you to make a phone call or to apologize? Does God want you to talk to someone about spiritual things? Invite them to church maybe, or 
begin the journey that leads to that ultimate invite there? Has God wanted you to encourage someone that He's put in your heart to say thank you to them or to just, just let them know that you're thinking about them and you've yet to, to move on that intention? Remember, you need to turn your win into now. You don't know what that's going on in that other person's life. And God is using you as the preserver, the life preserver, if you will, to reach out to that person. I can't tell you how many times that has happened with me. I'm just being who I know to be, trying to encourage, trying to engage people in conversation and find out down the road that that was pivotal to them. I told you a few weeks ago about someone my son found who had made a Facebook post about an engagement I had with them in a business. And they said it was obvious I wasn't hitting on them. It was because it was a female and she was not of the same skin color as me. So she said it wasn't anything to do with any of that. But that let me know that God still hears and he knows is what that person put. What has God been asking you to do? What has he been leading you to do? But you're too busy. Too many things going on. Too many when-then things and your life is just swirling so much that you don't have the time to do what he's called you to do. Can I remind you of this, of this again? Your life is brief and your days are opportunities for investment. How are you spending them? Are you investing well? Because here's what I know. Galatians tells me, whatever I sow, I'm going to reap. If I do it sparingly, I'm going to reap sparingly. So here's why I invest heavily in everybody around me. And you guys too. I pray for you all every single day. It may not be my name. Some of you, it's by face and by your story. You've told me your story. And I pray for you and I pray over that story, whatever it is that you're going through. I do that often. And I don't do it necessarily to get something in return, but I do know this. As I'm praying about what concerns you, which I know also concerns God, God's going to lead somebody else to pray for me and what concerns me. And that sometimes helps me to alleviate some of the weight and the pressure in my own life because I know God's got people he's leading to pray for me. I may not know them or see them, but the Holy Spirit knows and he can move on them to pray in the Spirit for me. I know that's happening all the time. What has God called you to use your gifts to do and you've failed to do it? Remember the nativity? He gave you all the gift of this. Some of you better ones than others. Mine's kind of a Forrest Gump one. As he's calling you to use your gifts, your smile, your person, your presence, and you've yet to do it. Please do not look at, at, at church life as something to just come in, take, and leave. God wants us more connected and more involved than that. And we're going to do all that we can in the new year to engage in this space as we have kind of now figured out and kind of gotten our bearings and how we're doing and what we can do. We're going to engage a little more heavily in moving deeper into some times where we can connect in prayer and praise and in participating in what's going on in our world. And we want you to, to do that with us. How many of you will agree to do that with us? How many of you are ready for more from God? How many of you want more from God? Are you ready to do more for Him then? Turn your win into now. All right. Proverbs 3, verse 27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. What has God been asking you to do? What has it been moving on your heart to do? To lay something down in obedience to His leading in your life. Maybe he's been leading you to start giving financially, tithing. And maybe you've just been a little ten you know, tentative. and you're just, I, I. Whatever he's leading you to do, God would not lead you to do something that he was not trying to lead, where he was not trying to lead you towards something else. Does that make sense? What good intentions have you not acted on yet? Can I ask you to do this? Can you close the gap? Would you close the gap because your life is brief and you want to close the gap on that if and when and turn it into now. And here's the third thought, the last one. I want you to turn your whole heart to God. If we really want to talk about living purposefully and worthily, there's no better time than to turn your whole heart to God. I don't know if I'll read all of these verses, but in Mark chapter 12, basically what I was going to read there because I don't want to 
belabor the point. The words of Jesus when asked what the greatest commandment were. In verse 29, he said this, quoting the Old Testament, the Lord our God is one. He is the one and only Lord. In verse 30 in Mark chapter 12, and he said, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And he gave a second equally important commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Here's what I think God would say to us in all of that. Let's not live with a divided heart. It, it, it wrecks me sometimes when I hear people talk about their past in such a way that there's, it sounds like there's nothing but regret. I've talked to so many people, some who are, are retired now or, or a, a little older, their kids are no longer in the house, and and it seems like the enemy is trying to get them to focus on what didn't go well, what didn't work out, what mistakes were made. And, and life is just filled with regret. When Tammy's father was nearing his transition to heaven, there were a certain couple of conversations he would have all the time. Am I, am I right? And, and it just, it wrecked my heart to hear this wonderfully sweet man who had given so much of his life as a pastor. How many years did he pastor? 50? Over 50 years he pastored. But towards the end of life, and I know that his, his thoughts and his, his mind was slipping a little bit, but even in that slippage there, for the regret to come through, especially about things that were connected to family, choices that he wished had been different. And what I don't want for you is to be 20 years down the road should Jesus tarry, and especially if you're younger, if you're in your teens or your 20s or 30s, you can get a jump on some things that the rest of us may have not done so well. In deciding today that you're going to live with an undivided heart before God. And if God tells you to do something, you quickly say yes and you just do it. I love what Andy Stanley says. He says, better choices, fewer regrets. His whole media online presence is wrapped in that thought right there. Better choices, fewer regrets. I've kind of made that a thing that I do. And he goes on to say it like this. When you're making choices in light of where you are today and where you've been in the past or in where you, and, and where you, and where you've been in the past and where you want to be in the future, what's the right thing to do today? In light of where you are today, where you've been in the past and where you want to be in the future, what's the right choice to make today? I think the best choice you can make is this, to live with an undivided heart. Live with an undivided heart. If you're a single person, live with an undivided heart. Don't do what everybody else is doing. If you're watching online and you're doing what everybody else is doing, you'll get what everybody else got. If you devalue yourself and your body and your thoughts and your mind, you're doing just that. You're devaluing yourself, your thoughts and your mind. You are much more precious. You are much more precious to God than you know. If you're married and you're in the room, what God has given you might seem heavy and weighty now in the person that you said yes to, but I can promise you it's worth fighting for. And when I say fighting, I'm not talking about verbally and physically. I'm talking about engaging what God's word says, declaring that, affirming that over that relationship, and then saying, God, how do you want me to live today? What do I need to do today? What do I need to say today? What do I need to change today? Because I don't care how spiritual are you are, if God's word can't change you, what's the point in the word? Your spirituality is kind of shallow if what God wants to say to you does not change. Is this too heavy for y'all? I know it's Thanksgiving weekend, right? How many of you are thankful? How many of you are full? How many of you are done with turkey for a while? <laughs> Did you hear the collective? Mm. <laughs> I don't mean to be heavy on you. I, I just want y'all living in such a way. I want our church to be a beacon of hope. And the only way it can be that, the only way we can be a light to the world around us is if the light that's in us is shining brightly. I want people to walk in these doors and sense a holy difference. Not because of royal boo banner, banners on the wall and 15,000 wreaths. I want it to be not because of a structure, but because of people. Are y'all with me? I want it to be because whenever we're worshiping and you're seeing people lift their hands, it's attractive. It's contagious. 
And it becomes something that people long to engage in themselves. So here's what I would say to you in closing. Give God everything. Every part of your life. Don't hold anything back. Put everything in God's hands. Don't live with the worry and the anxiety that the world is trying to put on you. You cast all your care on Him because He cares for you. You do that by putting God first in everything. Let me wrap it up for you. Turn your win into now. Turn your intentions into actions. And turn your whole heart to God. How many of you will do that? Can we thank God for His Word today? Yeah, come on. If you're watching today online and and maybe some portion of today's message, you felt God speaking to you or pulling on your heart, even for those of us in the building this morning, even if it's just one thing you heard. I've often heard somebody I follow with great intention say, you know, the greatest notes from anything you've heard are not necessarily the exact quote of what you heard, but what you heard God say to you when you heard what you heard. So if God spoke something to you today while I was speaking, don't be impressed with something I said. Value and be impressed that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you while I'm talking. And whatever He spoke to you, commit to doing that one thing. If I could just get you to commit to doing one thing each and every single week, if all you did was turn every win into now, or the next time you heard yourself make a promise that you knew was probably about a 90-10 differential in actually coming to pass, and you know the 90 was the intention and the 10 was the action, don't say it. Don't even bring it up. And then if it's been that you've been living with a divided heart, you've been consumed with things that are consuming you, and it's not uh, breeding a very healthy relationship with God, would you change that? Would you surrender today to fully com- committing yourself to God? Could we all do that this morning? I, get, I think the, the greatest thing that could happen on this Thanksgiving weekend as you stand to your feet this morning is that we all just completely surrender to God and give Him everything. Come on, let's stand to our feet. And if you're watching online this morning, I'm going to pray a prayer for all of us to fully commit to living with an undivided heart before God. And I don't know what plans you have, what things lie ahead of you in the next few weeks and, and stuff like that. I know, I know we got a newly engaged couple in the building. Y'all making plans. Very cool stuff out ahead of you. But regardless of what it is that's out ahead of you, if you live toward those things with a fully committed heart to God, those things will only be better. Did you hear me? Those things will only be better. So if you'll pray this prayer with me or let my words be your prayer, just stretch your hands out to to heaven in a posture to receive from God today. Father, for those that are watching online and those in the building this morning, we stretch out our hands to receive from you also as a way to say to you, God, we surrender everything. We refuse to live with a divided heart, a divided mind, divided intentions. God, we surrender everything to you today. We give you everything today. As we close out the remaining weeks of this year, God, We're going to live as purposefully today as we did on January 1, 2022. Father, we say to you, you can have it all because you are our all in all. We thank you for loving us so much, for forgiving us, making us new, setting us free. We thank you for Jesus. And everybody who believes that, receives that, and that is your heart. Would you say amen to that prayer? Amen. Now, come on, let's thank God again for his great love for us. Can we do that? Yeah. If you were watching online with us today, thanks for being with us. I call you blessed today in Jesus' name. Until we're together next time, you have a very blessed week. 